Don't focus on volume. Focus on being consistent. Focus on making the you know making the time to be here at least twice a week. You know, even more with the beginners nowadays, I like to implement games a lot. Where, on my mind, I try to make something for them to accomplish, and I try to make that something for them to accomplish not very hard. When I'm in camp, man, I hardly I hardly train uh, twice a day or more than twice a day. Like as far as like jujitsu, I go in and I put in like three hours or like you know sometimes a little bit more than that, and I'm fine with it. Looking back on the match, whenever he sat back to the saddle, he already had my leg isolated. And whenever I came up, my heel was already exposed, so it wasn't much time to respond. I think I kind of started a little a little, a little bit kind of like uh, stagnant. There's a lot of athletes there. They're trained. They're based on shit happens. Run to the out of bounds that you're going to get a reset. Yeah. So that kind of creates the whole thing that we that do jiu-jitsu for a while understand. But people that are just getting into it, people that are just watching for fun, they can't really say, oh, why did you stop? I remember back then I could lock a triangle on myself really easily, like inverting. <laughs> oh, you could lock a triangle on yourself? Yeah, I could lock a triangle on myself like inverting. <laughs> I, can't, I can't lock a triangle on someone else. <laughs> <laughs> Victor, welcome to the podcast, my friend. How are you? Thank you, guys. I'm doing good. Glad for uh, for the opportunity. Always good to stop and talk a little bit. I think we get so used to just like train, compete, and do all those things. So it's kind of you know good uh, to have opportunity to tell a bit more of my story on what I'll be up to lately. Yeah, no, that's great, mate. And uh, did you say you've been traveling recently as well? You just got back to Austin, I think you said. Yes, I've been doing some uh, uh, kind of like off season work uh, in Phoenix, Arizona. Just trying to, you know, get a body uh, 100%. It's kind of hard to be always 100% when you train that hard. So I just had a long season. So kind of like give the body a rest, but also not, you know, not stopping the work. Trying to find, you know, tweaks to get better and stuff like that. Yeah, nice, man. And yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll talk about um, obviously your training and everything. But obviously we're, what, six, week, six weeks removed now from CJI. Um, and wanted just to, to ca- catch up on that really, mate, and just see where you're currently at and how you're feeling after the event. Obviously, I think like a lot of people, Danny and I were were kind of rooting for you and, and thought you had a, a very strong chance of winning that whole event and obviously got caught um, with that, you know, with that heel hook. Um, I mean, how are you feeling about it now? Uh, now, now? Now it feels way better. I feel like it healed yeah. up more. <laughs> if it was like a day after, I'd probably feel a little bit more, more upset or sad, but I think it was part of, you know, what happens. Not the first time I've lost. It was the first time I got submitted in black ball, but, you know, I am, I, I guess, submit every, every so often training. So it was something it was very surprising, but it opened my eyes to something that I might have to get better at. Uh, I was definitely not expecting that to happen. I didn't, I, I, I knew very little about Lucas, and now I know, you know, I know who he is uh, here in his spot on the elite grappling. And overall, I was just happy to be part of the event. And not, not every time it's going to go your way. I look back and I think I had an amazing season uh, up to CJI. I had good fights. I competed at the biggest stage. Um, I competed against really good and tough competition. I bet, I think uh, the, the toughest competition would be that weekend, either CGI or UCC, but I ended up not, have, not having to go my way. But it's just something that I'm, you know, like, you, you don't like it, but you, you learn how to get used to it. You, you have to learn to get past it so it doesn't bring you down too much. Uh, as I said, I'm kind of like, you know, like a leader inside my school and inside my team, so I got I, I to gotta behave as such. And I think it's just as a lesson, you know. I think I did very good things on, on, going up to the camp. There were some things that I could probably change. And looking up, looking up to the next one, that's probably the things that I'm going to take as a lesson, you know. And, and what are your reflections on that match? Do you think, you know, that, you know, was there anything you could have done different? Or, you know, is there anything that you're now working on as a result of, of the outcome of that match? I think it was a little, you know, I don't think I started the pace that I should. Lucas definitely looked like he had a plan. Uh, looking back on the match, whenever he sat back to the saddle, he already had my leg isolated. And whenever I came up, my heel was already exposed. So it wasn't much time to respond. I think I kind of started a little a little, a little bit kind of like uh, stagnant. I wasn't like very smart to the grips. Definitely sometimes that comes from you not knowing your opponent that well. So you kind of like want to let it play by how it goes. And that usually is a tournament thinking too. Like when you have more than one match, some people they start slow and then they pick up as they go. I, I tend to you be that way, even like tournaments as worlds and stuff like that. So I think it was a little about that. If I had to change anything, I'll probably be smarter with the grips. But you know, like I'm a guy that I don't really look back to things and like try to change things. I just try to take 
whatever happens and shape my next performance off that. Uh, it's been like that since color belts. I had the amazing, I had, I think one of the best, you know, uh, careers in the color belts. I won everything, but it wasn't like win everything like this. I had moments where I won double gold and then the other year I won gold and silver. So I think moments like this shaped me to who I am today. So I don't think I'll, I, I, there's something I would have changed, but from now on, I'll definitely be smarter with the grips and stuff like that. I think I've been taking up the Nogi challenge, you know, like the, 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 the challenge of becoming an expert in Nogi for the past two years. And so it's been a fun, uh, fun journey. And it just fuels me to learn more and, you know, like a whole, a whole side of a new game that I might look into it too. Cause I think him, Levi, they're doing pretty interesting stuff too there. So it might be something that I, 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 I don't, I don't take pride on not uh, upgrading my game. So it might be something that I might look to apply on myself as well. Yeah, no, that's a good mindset, mate. And you mentioned, obviously, you didn't know too much about Lucas. Is that typically your kind of approach to competition? Do you not worry too much about the opponents? Or, you know, do you typically do research? Like, what do you normally do? Uh, I do research, but with him, it was kind of different because he, you know, like, he he had had some competitions, but he didn't compete against anyone that I ever competed against or anyone that I actually know. I think he probably had one fight that I looked on that was against a guy that competed in DCC two years ago. I think his name is Bob something from Australia. And I, I as far as like the research I made, that was his toughest match. Like the guy that I, most well know guy that he's fought before. I could be wrong, but on my research, that's how I found it. And I, I think it's really hard to, you know, for me to watch tape from whenever a high level guy is fighting someone that is not as high level as him. So that's what it looked for the match that I had said. I saw like he had a lot of finishes, so it's kind of hard to see what was his game because the, the opposition did they you know put him in a spot where he used his best game. I feel like so it's kind of you know it's kind of challenging. It was it was perfect for him because not a lot of material from him out there, so you could kind of like keep his keep his game quiet. And yeah, going back to it, I definitely do do like to look what my opens are doing. That kind of helps me like visualize a little bit how the match is gonna go. But as I said, I'm usually I'm I'm used to compete with people that are like competing consistently and people that are like are uh, competing at the highest uh, level. Not saying that he doesn't, but you know they're competing even flow grappling or UFC pass every other week, and so it's kind of easier for you to know what they've been up to lately, where their main game are, and stuff like that. So yeah. with him, it was kind of tricky because I didn't know I didn't know much about the guy. I definitely know he would do leg locks because he's from Australia, but. Other than that, <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't. I didn't know much what to expect from him. I knew he liked K guard and stuff like that. that. That's actually the thing that I was watching for the most. Uh, whenever he started entering the K guard, I kind of sat back and like kind of kicked my leg back out. But I definitely wasn't expecting that, that step back to the leg lock that he did. It was, it was super slick when it his, his movement was. It reminds me of just uh, just a bigger version of Latcham Giles when he was moving. I was like, God, it's. You can see those Australians. They have like the same pattern, like you said, with a K guard and inviting and just regarding over and over. It's like, yeah, it's like, it's like I, I knew what side he would go other. for the K guard. I kind of like knew what side he would go for the K guard. I knew he, the, the, the way of guard that he played, but I, I honestly, I couldn't find much, you know, uh, content of like the back step that he did. I wasn't. I wasn't even expecting he would do that. I was actually more worried that he would sit back on my straight ankle and switch to some sort of like leg tournament. That did not come into my mind at all. What weight was he? I don't know. I would say eighty-eight kilos or so. Yeah. Yeah. He didn't. He didn't look very big. Yeah. I don't think many people do next to Victor. To be fair. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But that sometimes can be a bit so awkward. Then, isn't it? It's tricky because they're they're so small and just trying to maneuver them. Yeah, f- fighting smaller guys can be tricky when you're a bigger person because you gotta find your you, you gotta fit the space better. So, you know, depending on how skilled they are, depending on how their game is. I think his game is kind of like he's used to be kind of compressed. He likes to revert, so it makes it extra tricky for someone bigger to pass the guard. But yeah, props to him. Yeah, man. And obviously, a lot of people were expecting to see. Uh you know, Victor Hugo and, and Nicky Rod final. Um, obviously, you were the last person to beat Nicky Rod. Um, what did you make of his performance and his run in the event to, to the victory in the end? I think he looked great. Uh, the event, you know, like it was organized by his team. So I think maybe some people are like, oh man, are they going to pull it to his side? Or are they going to favor him somehow? But no, like they put him into a straight fire and he came out of it alive, man. He looked pretty good. Uh, I think probably one of his best performances uh, that people have ever seen. He looked very calm 
and he had amazing submissions, which usually he doesn't have submissions, but that day he went, you know, three for three, looked very centered. And I kind of been on his side of things too. So kind of seeing, you know, probably one of the toughest competitions go out in the first round, it kind of brings your confidence higher. And you could just see he was getting better and better towards the finals. Uh, the tournament was crazy, you know, like, I was expecting maybe John Gaber to go to the finals with him. John Gaber ended up losing, ended up losing to uh, Flip Andrew. Had a tough match against Tackett, which also would thought, we all thought would probably be the other finalist. But uh, I think he just did his thing. You know, he went out there and he proved that he was the best on that day. And I actually, you know, like I think it was whatever whoever won. I was just excited. It was a great moment for the sport. And one thing that was cool too for me is like. I think I carry myself uh, in a really particular way, you know. Uh, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not shy to talk about things, but also I try to be respectful, and I think that brings a lot of people to your side. And whenever I lost, a lot of people are like, "Man, I feel bad for the guy." Like that's probably one of the most comments, the, the most amount of comments that I saw on posts and everything. Feel bad for Victor. Feel bad for Victor. So I was, I was really grateful, appreciative of people sending the support. It definitely feels way better than whenever you get your shoulder broken and people are like, "Well." Well deserve it. So I just, it just felt good. <laughs> it just felt good to get some support after a tough weekend. So it just yeah, you know, I'm like sure. it kinda enlightened me to show me that I'm going in the right direction. Even not picking on the right or wrong direction, the direction that I wanted to pursue. So it just showed me that the message that I'm trying to pass is getting well received by people and it was just cool to receive the support. It was actually funny because man, after CGI I've been receiving a lot of support. A lot of people know me more. Somehow, I think well, like the the, the the hype and everything walking up to it helped, and I keep I keep getting the same type of, like comments when I meet people in person. They're like, "Amazing performance, man! You did great." I'm like, oh, "That's not very true, but I'll take it anyways." You know, like <laughs> <laughs> I think the build up to CJO there was very much it was you versus Nikki. Yeah. So even if people mm-hmm. weren't that aware of you before, they were just coming into the sport or whatever. You know, a lot of my my friends were saying like, oh, the Victor Hugo's like, you know, do you think he's going to beat Nicky? And, and I think that was the big talk before him because you're yeah. on opposite sides as well. It felt like he was kind of destined for that big, big money final, which is obviously a shame it didn't happen. But again, hopefully they do it next year and, and you can just get him next year, mate. Yeah, and that was my, my, my goal. You know, primarily you want to win, but... I also wanted to, you know, make a good, uh, make, make a good, not, not performance, but make a, make a good appearance for the event overall so we can push it to it happen more often. You know, I think we grapplers, we really need that. It's something exciting. I think it's different for the Lager Championship uh, type of tournaments that we are used to having Jiu-Jitsu. It's something very entertainment-based. And I think the sport needs it, you know. I think it was cool. And they looked happy. They looked like they were excited for the second edition. And I look forward to be there and, like, look for redemption, you know. Just a quick one, mate. What did you make of the pit? Did you like it? Yeah, I liked it. I didn't spend a lot of time on it. <laughs> <laughs> but definitely I liked it. Uh, to watch, which was the most thing I did that weekend. A lot of <laughs> watched a lot of matches. It was amazing because even if you're close, if you're far, you can kind of like have a good uh, glimpse of what's happening. And I really like uh, having a format where the raft doesn't have to do a lot. He's just there basically as an MMA, MMA ref. He's just there to maybe like reset if you guys get too crazy, scramble too far off the pit, or he's not doing a lot. I think like many jiu-jitsu competitions, the resets are kind of like one thing that makes it like boring or less or yeah, let's say is, confusing yeah. because whenever something's about to happen, there's a lot of athletes there. They're trained, are based on shit happens, run to the out of bounds that you're going to get a reset. Yeah. So that kind of creates that whole thing that we that do jiu-jitsu for a while understand, but people that are just getting into it, people that are just watching for fun, they can't really say, oh, why did you stop? Like, how is it going to be back? Like, it creates kind of like, you know, something kind of boring. So having on that pit, it makes you feel like action is back. You know, there's no way for running for it. Yeah. Which is something that you can actually see that one match that was interesting was like actually Max versus Nicky Rod. Max was looking really good towards the beginning. He picked Nicky Rod like I never seen anyone picking him and like threw him over the wall. <laughs> but on my end, like looking as a competitor, I was like, man, he's going to gas and there is no reset. Like you use your whole energy. Like there is no like, oh, we went out of bounds. I'm going to fix my rest card. I'm going to like, you know, <laughs> look at my toe. <laughs> look to the clock and like the ref is going to like, you know, like it's just going. So I could kind of see like, he kind of like used a lot of energy and the, fa- the fight kept going, you know, and he kept coming at him. He kept defending, but I think like half a minute, he kind of got too tired to fight anymore. And there was no way out, you know? So 
I think that's the type of like thing that Jiu Jitsu needs as far as like entertainment, the consistent pace that's going to like lead to action and nonstop action eventually I think would like lead it to a tap or something like that. You know, there's no way out. Yeah. yeah I think hands down, it was the best spectacle to watch of any jiu-jitsu tournament I've ever watched. Obviously, I've only, I've only been doing it a few years, and that was my biggest gripe when I was first getting into jiu-jitsu and watching jiu-jitsu, was just the resets all the time. I was like, oh, this is just annoying. It's just so frustrating to watch, especially when you don't understand it that much. Um, and then, yeah, because you didn't know why they were rolling out. There is, a anti, there is a whole entire game behind it of like fighting for yeah. resets, escape and stuff like that. So it kind of like kills that. So you actually have to be doing jiu-jitsu the whole time. Yeah, I heard you talking about, uh, I think it was when you signed the contract for CGI, I heard you talking about the, the reset and the tactics around that and how you're kind of relying mm-hmm. on the referee to to kind of do a good reset and actually that can sway a match one way or another. Yeah. And I hadn't really thought about that from a competitor's perspective. I'd obviously, like you, thought about it from a, uh, a spectator's perspective. But but yeah, that's, that's potentially going to be massive, isn't it, if you take that away? Yeah, and the other thing that I also don't really like about open mats, like mats, regular mats, is like sometimes they're not big enough. And then like, you know, I think you see it started to make it popular too, where you go roll on the carpet on like concrete. I'm like, man, what the hell is like, are you going backwards? <laughs> like, can we, not come up with, can we not come up with any better, uh, any better solution? Like, of course, you will get views because it looks like a brawl, like, but like looking... <laughs> We we don't have like most of Jiu-Jitsu has don't even have like a health insurance. So how fun is it like two guys that are uninsured rolling concrete that could get severely hurt? You know, so I I understand for the like high perspective it looks like something crazy is happening, but if you turn into a pit, you're kind of gonna get the same scrambles everyone tends to be. You know, it's gonna be a safer thing, and I think mats were created for a purpose. So I do I think the whole thing about rolling in concrete and like carpet is just kind of weird. Yeah, no, I agree with that definitely. And, and what did you make of the the actual scoring as well? So that that sort of three rounds, sort of that ten must system. Uh, I don't think I, I think like some people are kind of like you know like oh was it who won who who didn't win? But I think the fact that they kept updating who was winning each round helps a lot. Mm. That was actually smart because if you leave the whole thing to the end, that's when I think people are going to talk about it more. So I think. Overall, it was like very clear who was winning or not. I think a couple of matches we will definitely be, you know, regardless the point, the the the, the score and everything. That's always going to be tricky for you to judge. Like Levi and I think Rutuolo and like the, those matches. I think I think because there's not a lot going on, you know. So I think the way that they see it, it's like you know, like both of you are looking for uh for the attacks, but the way I see it, it's like if the guys try to pass the guy, but he can't at least he's giving his full effort, you know, it's not like he's like not picking all the chances opportunities that he's getting. But if the guy's playing guard, he attacks a leg, the opponent sits and he doesn't come up. I don't think he's like fully going to the end of his attack. He's kind of like going halfway. So I could see the, the judges seeing it that way. But I think overall, whenever the match goes that way, I, I, I didn't seem like him super, you know, upset about it. I've been on both ends and it, 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 it's kind of like up to, you know, whatever goes. I think it's kind of like a tough way to win a million dollars or to lose a million dollars. But <laughs> as I said, we want to work towards where we're going to have more opportunities like that. And I think both guys had a really good tournament. And I think whenever you don't have like scoring very clear, it kind of leaves it open for you. You're just trying to like go through the guy. You just like want to kind of like dominate it. So unless, unless, unless it's like very even, like, you try really hard, you can make a lot of happen. A lot of times you see like that, that guy clearly won. Like he didn't have to admit, but he passed, took the back, he took it down. So it makes it clear. And I think yeah. the main thing too is like, even looking at Andrew Tackett, like he had really good performances, but I don't think on the back of his mind, there was ever like a thing, man, I cannot lose because if I don't lose, I'm not going to make any money. Like I felt like from every athlete there, I felt like, uh, like everyone felt kind of safe to give their best and regardless of the result, give it a show because everyone got paid well just to show up. So I think whenever that happens, people are more open to just like let it all go. You know, of course there's a million dollars in the line, but you have so many matches to get the million dollars. You have 10K to show up. You're just like willing to go hard and not look back. Once you get to the finals, of course, that exact match is like for a million dollars. So things might be more tense, but still I think like, you're going to be so hyped that you don't even like are thinking about it you just want to go yeah no i think that's very true i think it definitely does give you a little bit of a 
a little bit of reassurance and free reign to, to be a bit more creative and daring, I think, when they're training or sorry, when they're fighting, yeah. for sure. To make it simpler, it's like when you compete, when you show up and you step on the mat and have plus 10K on your side, it feels way better to compete than whenever you compete, you step onto a mat and you're like minus 3K. Like <laughs> hotel, yeah. PT, food, like your mind, I think at least for most of the athletes, you're going to be like, fuck, wait, like I'm, I'm behind here, like, I gotta like fight just enough so I don't lose, and then I make some something out of it. So it was it was something to help the people talk about make it more professional. So I think that will definitely help. Do you think ADCC will up their prize money again and up their like entry money and really look after the athletes next year because CJI, or do you think they'll just carry on how they're going? I really hope so. I uh, I I for for what I know the. Actually, you know, they're going to pay some uh, some money to the guys, which is good. It's already something. Mm. They do pay for the hotel and the flights and all that. But having the extra, you know, cash for you to just show up and compete, I think that's like something that we should be already having, like most of the tournaments. I think most of the private tournaments, like, um, you know, those tournaments where they usually are putting a grand prize, you already get that. But the tournaments as big as ABC, I, I, I definitely think they're not going to go back. I think they're just going to go going up. And if they don't, they're just going to see that thing happening more and more where they're going to have competitors, you know. I think Craig went there and proved that it's doable. Like, he picked, the, I think, the most, like, if you had to pick the hardest date for you to put a tournament together in Jiu-Jitsu, it would be that date. Like, to, to go head-to-head in ABC is something really challenging. So, he himself, like, not even like I got an everyday tournament before, Proof that it's doable. I think, like, if tournaments know, if you know, like, organizers and stuff don't open their eyes for that, they're gonna see themselves more and more in the situation where they have to kind of like weigh in, like, oh, should I apply money on this? Or should maybe pay the others so I don't lose them through competition? And just to be in a free market, that could always happen, you know. So, I think for us athletes, it's great. Uh, we have options, you know, like whatever you want to go for, you can. So, I think. Tor, I think that's why, like, it was one of the things that made me switch over to CGI because I saw that it was going to be something that I would do it that would kind of like be bigger than myself. That could help people, you know, like my guys, like people that are competing, that I compete against, kind of like do better in life. So that's something that we look forward to see how like change over the years. And I think it's one of the things that you know is going to push me towards keep supporting CGI and stuff like that. Yeah, no, I did wonder about your decision, mate. But yeah, I think that's, um, yeah, it's, it's, it feels like the obvious one to do, really, isn't it? Like you say, it's not just about that chance to win a million dollars, but also just to up the, you know, the pay for the sport and the athletes across the board. It's yeah, a bit of a no brainer. Even if I don't win it. the million dollars, maybe one day I'll have a student or my good friend, I don't know, like Felipe or, or the other blacks about to train me, they're going to have the chance to win a million dollars one day. So it makes it good for everyone, right? And as I said on other podcasts, I think that one of the, bad feelings that I have usually in for jiu-jitsu competition is I go out there, I win, I beat everyone and I make good money. But all my opponents are like making barely, barely making money. Some guys are struggling financially. Some guys are struggling with some other stuff, fees and stuff. So you're like winning, but you're like, man, like I'm so far beyond some guys that is not even fair. Like how can you make a fair where you're actually going to have good competition, which not saying that I don't, that is definitely great comparators, but I think there's a big, you know, uh, difference sometimes between like guys that are doing super out, the guys that are don't. So kind of like shortening that bridge is going to make the whole sport greater because there's going to be more competitions. There's going to be more exciting matches and stuff like that. For those that might not be fully aware of that, the financial situation in jujitsu, I mean, we're, we're kind of in it, not at a high level, but we understand that there isn't a lot of money in it. Um, and people are obviously aware of the, the noise that CJI made. But I mean, you know, even as a high level sort of multiple time world champion, where do you typically like, where are you able to earn money as a jiu-jitsu competitor? Is it, is it comps? Is it like instructional seminars? Like what, what, what does the landscape look like in regard to the money for athletes? I think it really depends on your style. Uh, there's definitely people that did the whole career over competing, you know, because even more nowadays, people think, oh, it's a great time to live because you can make money every weekend if you compete hard. You know, if you like to compete, you can make a thousand here, a thousand there. Then you like, you know, you travel somewhere, you find a GP that no one knows about, you make 5,000. Then you come back and make a small. So I think people, some people, they stack money like with competition. And then on the side, they get sponsors, which usually are jiu-jitsu based sponsors, a gear sponsor, something like that. And then lately, you've been like a blast on the instructionals. The instructionals are something that I believe is cool. It's not my, uh, 
my bread and butter. I do have some instructionals, but I don't know if because I'm like, I'm from Brazil, like people don't know like how I speak English or how good of my teaching is. It's not my main thing. I do have some products. Uh, and there's also the, the, the way of like becoming a businessman, which is the way that I decided to do, because I was thinking about long journey, my career, man, like I've been full of like moments where I couldn't perform as I wanted to, because I've been injured. Uh, I think each athlete has his course. Sometimes the athlete's course is going to be there. They're too athletic. They're too strong to learn the proper technique. And some others going to be like me. Sometimes you're doing great in training. You're doing great. You're doing all the things you can, but then you're going to come up with some injury and stuff. So I've had that, uh, I believe, since Purple Belt. I've competed in many world championships where I didn't have a proper camp because I was, like, hurt and stuff. So that made me have, like, a long vision of, like, man, I have to, you know, understand that I'm not going to compete forever. So what can I do on the side that's going to support my competition and is going to support myself even when I can't compete? So the way I look at it is, like, having a school. Uh, a, a lot of guys don't like to teach, but myself, I have a blessed teaching. And for me, it's just a great way to kind of, like, impact the community around me in a positive way, you know? Like, they kind of see how my day-by-day -day is. I remember when I won worlds uh, around like a year or so ago, double gold. I won worlds on Sunday, went back to the hotel, get ca caught the flight uh, Monday night, and early in the morning I was teaching the 6 a.m. class, and all my students, they're like <laughs> businessmen, they're ICO, and I got them. You just won the biggest summers, you're here teaching us. That's what's like, that's what's been driven. So they motivate me, I motivate them. Those guys are like in stages of life way above me, but it's just something that it kind of like, you're kind of trading the energy, trading, you know, not only that, but also knowledge. So I really like that. I was, I also spent time teaching kids and I think that's kind of like cool. Like someday this kid is jujitsu with me. He's going to be in college or something, but he remember, Oh, I, I, I learned jujitsu with this guy that was a world champion. He told me those words or even one thing that I would do, a lot of, a lot of parents in my school kind of like when and congratulated me was how I took my loss against Luca the CGI. They said that they use that as a, as an example for their kids. That whenever you lose, it's about like you know how are you gonna take that loss. So it's just something like that. You know, I think like it's a good it's a good use of my time. I have a blessed owner school. I've been owner school for three years. Like walking up to it, a lot of people thought and said like, "Man, is that the best decision right now?" Because it was right after it was right before winning my first world title as black belt and a lot of my friends people close to me they're like man are you gonna be able to do this like business owner like compete at the highest level and i've been doing it just great like, i've been doing just fine with it you know like it's actually be helpful because when i'm not when i'm not on a match compete training when i'm not on, like on doing the weight super hard i have time and i have somebody to kind of like put my mind on that i'm like thinking about my future so when it comes to jujitsu and making money i think there's different ways i'm definitely going the probably the hardest route you know there's probably the simpler ways, like if you do instructionals, not saying that it's easy, but you're going to do a lot of stuff online. It kind of gives you kind of permission to travel more, maybe do more stuff, like do more competitions. But the way I like to do things are a little bit different. But as I said, I'm not here for a long time. I'm here for a good time. So I want to make sure that there are things outside of it that's going to support myself on this road, on, on this journey of being a, a, an athlete and a competitor. Yeah, I think it's great if you can find that balance, mate. I know uh, Zanji, I think, was the same, wasn't he? I think he obviously, you know, won his multiple world titles while while teaching and coaching as well. Um, but I know a lot of jiu-jitsu athletes can't seem to strike that balance. That you know, they're either an athlete or they're a coach. Yeah, and I, I I honestly think there should be an option. You know, like you should be able to choose. No, I just want to compete. Like I don't want to do any teaching. I don't want to do any business. Like I want to compete. That's fine because if you look at the other sports, like people. I think it's like the least thing that you deserve if you're a professional athlete to leave it straight for your sport. But jiu-jitsu, I don't think like, it really depends on what you want to get from jiu-jitsu too. Like if you're comfortable right here, you can definitely leave this way. But I, I, I wasn't going to be comfortable there. I have like big goals that I want to achieve, you know, like I've been living in America for eight years and I've been able to accomplish a lot of things through jiu-jitsu, not only compet competitively, but outside of it too. So I think it's just like, what do you want to take from it? How far do you want to go? And, um, uh, what what your reality is yeah no that's cool man and just thinking about obviously future tournaments and competing you know obviously you've talked a little bit and alluded to to doing cji again uh, and supporting that tournament i mean obviously if there's if there's not a clash with adcc in the future would you still be looking to do that and do you expect that they'll invite you or do you think you'd need to go through trials to get back into adcc now um i think if if, which probably won't happen, like, because I think CGI happening next year, we'll definitely, you know, 
you definitely be its own thing. Like it won't be compared yeah. to ACC straight. Uh, I'll definitely do ACC because for me it's about where the toughest competition is, so I can challenge myself. And most likely, this you will have the toughest competition whenever CGI is not around. So I definitely will do that. Uh, relate, uh, regarding like invites, I've, I was actually was fortunate to be invited like all the times I went there. I was invited as a fresh black belt. I think I actually I was still a brown belt when I got invited and I got promoted in between when I did my first ADCC. So they were actually, they, they were always super nice to me. They, they invited me, but if it doesn't, like I, and I, and I got to do the trials, I, I don't really like, I don't feel bothered about it. It's like, if I can win trials, I probably shouldn't even be in there. So if trials, it is the way, like I'm going to do it. And I think actually it will be a good opportunity. Why the reason why is because I don't compete on the, the ADCC rule set that often. I probably competed like three times. So getting a uh, trial trials runs, wouldn't it be that, that, that bad. And it, I, I think, like, if the door is open to me to compete there again, I'll definitely do it if it makes sense uh, at the at the time, you know, which probably will be because the way I see it is Craig had to do it CGI at the same date as them. So people would kind of notice and uh, you'd be kind of like put the stakes like high at them. Oh, Craig is doing a tournament and he's competing with them. He better do something good where they can kind of like compete in the same level of production and like talent. Otherwise, no one's going to remember about it. There's going to be like a class C event. So I think being that he did that kind of put him on that spot already. Like everyone knows how big the tournament is. So I don't think he needs to kind of like, you know, do that again. Like he has his own thing already. So I definitely could see him doing it again same date. But if he doesn't, I think he'll be just fine because he already has all the hype that he needs. They may went on a run when it comes to podcasts. Like... If you look at the numbers that he de- that he made, they're incredible. So, I I, I kind of hope and I believe they're going to have their own things going on now. It is CGI, and as I said, like for the grappler, which is myself, the more options for us to compete, the more eyes to see us, the better. So, whatever the competition is, that's what I'm aiming for. Like, if you guys don't see me competing somewhere, it's probably, it's probably because I'm either hurt or it doesn't make sense as far as a career plan. But I'm I'm always down to scrap with the best, you know. Yeah, nice man. Yeah, hopefully you get the invite. I think there's obviously a lot of speculation about people leaving ADCC for, for CGI and how Mo might react to that. But I think by by making someone like yourself go through trials, it just potentially rules out so many other people getting through that process that are maybe unknown to get the opportunity. So so hopefully they, they do the right thing. That's the thing. That's the thing would kind of be like, if you think the biggest names didn't make them go through trials, who are, who are you going to invite? You know, like... We we'll yeah. probably you, you'll probably help them like recruit new stars, but it will be kind of like hard to. It'll be kind of like it'll be kind of going you know, backwards. Yeah, and people people make their names with ADCC, don't they? Yeah, so yeah. they make their names yeah, with yeah. ADCC. They need that opportunity. And honestly, trials is really good for guys coming up because it's a tough tournament that helps them like build build their confidence such as the big tournaments. How many trial guys haven't like won or made a podium? On uh, you see a good example is my friend Philippe Costa Casio. He won trials in Brazil, and that kind of boosts his confidence in a way where he went to the Worlds and he took third. He took out big names. But I think if he didn't have that trials run, probably wouldn't be as confident walking up to the tournament, you know. So having the trials run helps a lot. The new talent kind of like show up to Worlds and like, oh, I deserve to be here. I earned my spot. and I'm going to earn my spot through uh, the whole tournament to get a medal or even like win, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, we'll see. We'll see. But yeah, that may be good. Victor, I wanted to ask, you obviously mentioned that you've been in the US now for a while. You've obviously accomplished multiple world titles and you talked about sort of the multiple businesses that you're running and everything else. I'm really interested to hear about your journey with jiu-jitsu from, from you know, that, that very first experience and exposure to jiu-jitsu right through to becoming a world champion. Could you tell us about that? Yeah, uh, that is so much that I'm not really good at remember all the details, but uh, the thing that I remember is like when I show up to train, I was probably like the worst prospect ever, like we had the class, you know, we had a couple guys of my age. Uh, my professor never really had a favor, but I didn't think anyone there looked at me as like at this prospect. You, sometimes when you bring a kid to a sport, you kind of tell oh, this kid's athletic. He has like the, he has like the talent for it. Almost like a natural. I was totally the opposite. You know, I wasn't like a natural for anything with sports related. So what I think it kind of like got me into like staying in jiu-jitsu was the community, you know, like you were going there, you're rolling, you're joking around and messing with your friends and that's kind of like the main reason why i would go most of the time to hang out with my friends and 
eventually I started like learning some techniques and I was able to kind of like half do it through like an adult. So I was like, for me, it was a blast and going to, you know, back in, uh, I think I started, I was in high school, going back to school and like, people were like, Oh, you're doing jiu-jitsu now. I was like, yes, I'm doing jiu-jitsu. It's like, Oh, that's bad. It's kind of like gives you a boost too. So I never competed in any sport before I started competing in jiu-jitsu. I was able to win a couple matches, but uh, I think I did 12 tournaments the first year that I competed and I lost all of them. And on the last one, I was able to win. So going over to that process at the beginning kind of like helped me. I think kind of like mentally kind of like, oh, sometimes it's not going to go your way, but you just got to keep trying. Like I, I had like a bunch of silver medals. I would win perfect all the way to the finals and on the finals I would lose. So kind of like became a joke a little bit inside my school. The guys were saying, call me silver man, stuff like that. But then on the last tournament of the year, uh, I didn't do so bad in the finals. I was actually, uh, it was a draw. And then uh, I won by decision. So I was the first gold that I won uh, in jiu-jitsu. But uh, going up to the next year, I competed as a white belt again, like juvenile. And I was way more confident because I competed the whole year. So I, I started winning. And I think whenever I won the first gold, I won gold all the way through like blue, uh, adult blue, without ever losing like on my division at least. Like if I sign up as a heavyweight juvenile, I wouldn't lose, you know. Like I would just lose eventually in the absolute. So... I was able to build a lot of momentum from that juvenile white belt all the way to like, you know, probably almost right now. And that, I think that's, that's just like related to how tough my start was and just being able to kind of like, Oh, people don't believe you just maybe just work, be silent and make it, make your results stop speak for yourself. So since then, like, you know, like it was never too easy either because I, as I said, like as a, as a juvenile, you're about to go to college. So my parents, I was just a blue belt. So they were like, man, you got to do college. It's not like you're like, you're doing good at this sport, but it's not like you can make a living out of it. So you better get a job like eventually and start studying so you can like have a career. So whenever I was a blue belt adult, that's probably when I had my best uh, results as far as like internationally and nationally. I was able to win Brazileiros for IBJJF. And uh, I think it was like a 56 division or something. I was a heavyweight back then. That was my first tournament that I won for IBJJF. I was like, oh, man, I actually i am on that level that I can compete IBJJF and win because I'm from Fortaleza, Brazil, which is a part of Brazil where Jiu-Jitsu is really popular. But for you to fly inside Brazil, domestic flights is actually more expensive than flying sometimes from Brazil to America. So it's like that expensive. So for someone that doesn't have a job to fly, you know, inside the country to compete is almost impossible. That's why sometimes... A lot of the younger talent comes from the certain uh, states, such as Sao Paulo, Rio, and stuff like that, because that's usually where the biggest tournaments in Brazil are uh, held. Brazilian nationals, I don't know, South American, or all the other tournaments, they're all like on that on that area. So if you live there, it's a plus. You probably catch a bus ride or something, and you're right there. For us from Northeast, you got to take a four hour flight. There's hotel involved. So for you to come up with all that money, it's kind of hard. So. I was able to, you know, eventually get small sponsors uh, locally. And I don't even remember how I came up with the money to uh, compete at Brazilian Nationals. I won. And when I came back, I was like, man, like, I got to keep trying to travel uh, out there and compete against the best to prove and see how good my Jiu Jitsu is to maybe get a chance to compete at the biggest tournaments. What, with, with that being said, I was able to get some, some local people to actually start helping out of their own pocket. You know, like there's a guy, his name is Junior. And uh, Vitor, he helped. They helped me with money out of pocket to get my uh, U.S. visa for the first time. Uh, they're, they're they're like from nor- one of them is from Northeast, the other one is from the city. But they like to help athletes that they see that they have the talent, but they don't have the means to compete, you know, internationally. So they paid for my visa. You know, like I almost like giving up on competing worlds on the following year because I, I got my purple belt. So somehow I was able to get money to compete in Brazil and nationals and I won as purple. And then I bought a flight and I came to compete at, uh, worlds, uh, IBGF as purple belt. So I won double gold. Uh, no one knew me. So, you know, like usually when you're a color belt, you're kind of like the way that you kind of get a little bit of attention is like through Gracie mag back then, like some like articles they'll say, Oh, this guy should watch for this guy, man. Nobody knew the hell out of me. Like, this guy came all the way from Northeast and won everything. So that was the biggest, like, bam, like, that I had to have in my career. Uh, the guys, uh, Shanji and Saulo, uh, 
they had a, one of the black belts was the guy coaching me throughout the event because we had a friend in common. And they kind of scouted me like, hey, do you want to train us? You can give you an opportunity to train. You're a big dude. You need big dudes to train. And that's how my kind of like history here in America started, you know, kind of like in a short, uh, explain a short version. That's kind of like how everything happened. So it was kind of natural, but not. It took a lot of like training. I'm actually super grateful for the people that I was able to meet throughout my journey. But I think part of that was due to how I was raised and like the values that I hold. I was able to bring in you know, really positive people and people that were willing to help uh, me on this journey. So that's probably one of the main reasons where I stick to my ways to nowadays because that's what uh, helped me, support me to get here where I am now. So I kind of like to stick to my values probably because of that and more things too involved yeah that's amazing man it's um yeah it's always amazing to hear sort of people helping sort of young and upcoming athletes to, to have mm-hmm. the opportunities that's really cool and and when you were sort of back as a, a sort of juvenile and a blue and a, and a purple belt were were you already thinking at that point that this is what i want to do yeah uh definitely because uh i felt like that was my calling as well as like a sport you know like i try all the sports and i was really bad at them so whenever i hit the juvenile blue belt i was actually starting to get really talented and over there it's kind of like when my style was kind of started being born what do i mean i was already fighting ultra heavy but i i just thought it was boring to do just take downs and just be on top just be heavy so the one thing that i want that i did the most back then was just guard i remember as a juvenile blue belt i was able to uh go to paulo miao seminar and he actually used me as a uke because he knew how good I was like with bearing balls and stuff, which was awkward because of how big of a kid I was. So I had, I did have like, you know, I was lucky to have contact with those guys early on in my career. I went to Paulo's seminar. I went to several Leandro Lowe's seminar. He kind of like, he kind of met me as a white belt and we, he remembered me all the way through black. So I learned a lot from him whenever he would come teach seminars, show a little, a little bit of his entries, a little bit of his mindset. So he was a guy that had access early on because I was looking off to where my school, there was a guy in my school that he was the one that would bring the big names the most to our part of uh, the country. You know? So I had access to those guys, even though I wasn't training a lot, just to be around them, see how they train and stuff like that. And yeah, I think like as a blue belt, I started to develop the talent part. Like I had more skills, I have more tricks. And I was like, man, I, I think I'm good at this thing. Like hopefully I can keep doing it and I can compete at the highest level. And for me, I didn't know if it was going to be a career yet because of the financial part. So I was happy just winning the local tournaments. I would travel to other states to compete. Sometimes I would lose too. So uh, I was just enjoying it, you know? Like, I didn't know, I, I, I wasn't sure this was gonna be my thing actually up until Purple Belt. Because whenever I won the world as Purple Belt, as I went back to Brazil, I was like, now I have leverage to talk to my parents to prove them like, I can do this. Like, because if you win worlds uh, in an adult division, most likely if you keep um, stay on the right path, you have a chance at Black Belt. So, I kind of need the leverage on my side before making a big decision. And also like to prove it to myself, like if I had gone to the world and lost first round, I'm sorry, but I'm not really sure if I, had, if I was going to have the opportunities I have and if I was going to have the confidence to leave everything behind and move to the U.S. So kind of like dedicating myself and getting the results was something that prompted me to like, you can actually do this and you should do like a try to leave from it, you know? Yeah, man, that's, that's cool. And I wanted to ask about your big man flow and where that style came from. So it sounds like it was quite early on then you developed that style. I mean, yeah. I, I'm not I'm not like a, 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 a big guy in, in the same sort of level that you're a big guy, but I'm not a small guy. And one thing that I've found is I've always been a little bit limited with my mobility and my hips and everything else. Um, obviously, that is you know, quite, uh, quite crucial for a good guard. Have you always been quite flexible or did you kind of work on that as well as developing that game? I actually have I always had a good amount of flexibility because whenever I started training jiu-jitsu, I was chunky, but uh, one year in, I lost a lot of weight. So I actually became like almost like too skinny for it. So as I said, as, the, as, as that being said, I played a lot of guards. So I remember back then I could lock a triangle on myself really easily, like inverting. <laughs> you are, you could lock a triangle on yourself. Yeah, I could lock a triangle on myself like inverted. I can't, I can't lock a triangle on someone else. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how flexible I was as a, like a wow. juvenile blue belt or uh, white belt, but I had no strength. So my goal was like, 
well, as I get bigger, I want to have this flexibility, but I also want to be strong. So I kept trying to just like do my own game as I got bigger, but I honestly didn't get bigger all the way till I moved to the US. I didn't feel the need to. I was just growing as my body made me grow. Like my dad is pretty big and heavy, but uh, as I said, like as blue belt, I was probably like, I'm all the same height I am right now. I was fighting heavyweight, which is like, I can't even remember the weight. It's like 94 kilos, pretty light for yeah. my size, for my shape. So, uh, and whenever I was in the US, that I still train with like Lovato, Shanji, and those guys, like, oh, I definitely need to put some mass on, otherwise the body will break. <laughs> so I was actually kind of like, you know, as I said, gifted with the, with being flexible. And I think the main thing I had to do was just like kind of stick to the same game because either one or not in Jiu Jitsu, you kind of like exercise the mobility depending on what type of game you do. So since I did guard and a lot of like triangles and stuff, since I was a white belt, I just stick to it. And as I kept adding size, I just had to watch and not become too stiff with my movement. So I never reached that. I, I never really had to do a lot of yoga and stuff like that. But as I, as I, of course, now I cannot lock a triangle myself anymore. But <laughs> I, can, I can do omoplata. Omoplata I can. But a triangle, no. So <laughs> that's just I crazy. Still, I still, I still hold uh, some of the flexibility, but it was definitely more like genetics, I believe. But the main problem with me, though, was like I was always too flexible. I never really cared for strength training or anything. So that early on, I think kind of like, uh, how do I say, kind of stacked the injuries that I've had to nowadays, like lower back and stuff like that, because I was playing inverted guard against like huge kids whenever I was a blue belt. Like I would fight kids that are like 300 pounds and I would pull like reverse guard and like be, re- be inverted the whole time. I remember I fought Europeans as a purple belt, uh, I fought twice against a guy called uh, Safe Dean. I don't know if you guys are aware of him. Safe. He's a French no, no, black no. belt. He has a match against Mike Musumesi, Lucas. He's the big Moroccan guy. Right, okay. Oh, the, the massive Moroccan guy that Mikey fought. Yeah. You know you know the massive guy that Mikey fought. Oh, you know yeah, yeah, you, know you know you. He's huge. So he was huge. same uh he was same uh lineage as me, oh, same uh, time as me at Pearl Belt. So we actually fought each other twice the same day. The first fight, I swept him right in the beginning. That was the best thing ever because he couldn't get back on top. So I just kept like jumping side to side, kept him on the ground. The second match I had, I was really tired. And man, he stacked me for like, I think like seven minutes. I was able to win by a one advantage, but I was like stacked the whole time. Next day, I could barely walk. So I think that kind of like say, yeah. looking back. I lost like a little bit of a bar of longevity <laughs> on my competition on that day, you know? So definitely being flexible helped, but it kind of like pushed me to not care about strength, which I, I uh, if there was one thing that I said that I'm not do a lot, which I would look back and change it, probably like focus a little bit more on strength and protocol my body, my joints and muscles a little bit early on in my career. Yeah. And is that, is that something that you incorporate now? Do you do much strength conditioning and weight training and that type of thing now? Yes, yes, I, I had I had to. It was more like a, a need than anything else, you know. Like for the longest time, doing those pants and stuff like that. Whenever the whenever I got brown belt, uh, I got a roommate, and he was very into lifting. Like his his lifestyle would be lifting and doing jujitsu. So the main thing, like he would he would probably miss jujitsu, but not not miss lifting. And he would always get on my head, like you have to lift, otherwise you're just gonna break because you do all those things that the guy on your side does, which are not normal. But uh, your body can only take it so much. So that's when the first time I was like, oh, man, like this guy has a point. As long as I lived with him, I was able to, like, you know, put some muscle. That's probably, like, where I've added the most muscle when uh, early on in my career in brown belt. But then I got away from it till, like, I believe 2020, I got hurt again. I was like, man, now I got to take this lifting thing serious because it's not like I should. It would be good for my career. It's like a need. So nowadays, mm-hmm. it's a need. You know, I'm always trying to find ways to implement you know, a new kind of like method to my training where it's going to push me towards longevity, longevity. So for me on a daily basis, like or weekly basis, I cannot kind of like function if I'm not lifting or doing any sort of exercise that will help my body, you know, to uh, train and stuff like that. I might last for a couple of weeks, but something will start tweaking, neck, I don't know, hips or something, and they'll take me out for a, a, a good amount of time and then, I have to go back to it. So the the way that I found for me to be consistently on the mats, training hard, is through lifting. Yeah, I can agree more, mate. A lot of uh, people that I talk to at our gym, I'm uh, a personal trainer and so is Paul. 
And I say to everyone, like, just just lift a few times a week just to keep those niggles away. Because if you're if you're constantly training and never getting in the weights room, you're never gonna you're never gonna build up that resilience in the ligaments and the joints. And it just it just just wrecks you. Just wrecks you. Yeah. Yeah. And being a school owner, like you have different part you we have different uh types of clients or like students, right? You have that guy that likes let's say you have two guys, both of them like to train a lot. But one of them does strength work on a daily basis, and the other one does it because he likes jiu-jitsu the most. When I roll with them, I can feel that the guy that rolls, uh, that, that does strength training, is almost like a, a tough uh, rubber. I can kind of like bend him. I can like do <laughs> weird stuff him. He doesn't break. The other guy that doesn't lift, I feel there's like something fragile about it, that if I go too hard, something might break. So it's definitely kind of like incredible uh, the amount of help that lifting can do uh, for your jiu-jitsu. I don't think you got anyone has to become like a bodybuilder or something like this. You just have to find a program that supports your journey in jiu-jitsu because, you know, you put yourself in different positions that you're going to be kind of needing a lot of your body. And if you just take it from your body, you don't add anything, at some point you break. And that's one of the things that my mindset changed uh, a lot on this past three years, just finding ways to kind of like, uh, you know, towards longevity. I think a lot of people don't care about it in the sport, but for me, maybe being around Shanji and Lovato, guys that have been competing for the longest time, it made me realize that early on, you know, and I'm always trying to implement a new diet, a new style of workout, a new style of uh, recovery, so I can kind of perform at my best, but more than that, just like be more durable during my career. Yeah, no, it definitely helps, mate. And are you able to talk us through what your typical week of, week of weight training looks like? What sort of lifts you do and, and what sort of volume and everything else? Yeah, um, two, around two years ago, when I, uh, right after, you see, right after the loss to Gordon, that's when I actually, you know, I decided I need a guy to like take care of it on a daily basis. And I was able to meet uh, John Welburn from Power Athlete. He's an ex NFL player. So for the past two years, we were just building the base. You know, I didn't know how to squat very well, deadlift and stuff like that. So we started with the basics. Uh, up to the point where once a week we were doing max effort, so second day of the week we were doing dynamic work, third day of the week we were doing density work. So we were able to do that for around two years. Uh, I think the best showcase of what that work did to me was the Worlds, uh, Worlds 2023. I'm not wrong, I can't remember. Yeah, Worlds 2023 last year when I won double gold. I looked great and I looked... Uh, the conditioning part helped a lot, but also just the strength part, be able to just get somebody and just push them out. And it was yeah. something that I was needed within my game because I've been always, I've always been so technical, but almost too technical in a way where people say, man, why don't you just get people just like crush them? So <laughs> main reason was like, I couldn't, <laughs> I didn't have the strength for it, like the, the, the means for it. So having that on my side was perfect. But all that, that looking at two sides, the performance side helped, it helped a lot. But on the health side, it helped a lot too. Why? Because I felt more durable within the mat, like on the mats. Mm -hmm. Like I could go on for longer. Those tweaks that I usually have on my back or neck, they would go away because I was, you know, consistent lifting. And the main thing that was interesting too is sometimes I would have something going on with my back or like, you know, my shoulder. I would do a good lifting session and that would go away. So it was more, I was uh, imbalancing or something like your muscle needed to work and you needed to rest than uh, uh, anything else. So it, it's been definitely, definitely been a, a great journey right now. As of now, I'm, you know, mixing up a little bit more. Uh, I start working to uh, another person too. They're showing me uh, ways to work in specific muscles. And for me, it's just a journey to learn about my body, you know, like, uh, as I said, I think for me, one of the tough, toughest des decisions for an athlete is like pulling out or not competing a turn because they can't because they're hurt. One of the things where you should go, go out there and like lose because you lost, like the guy taps you or you lost by points, but to not have the chance to compete because you're injured, it's kind of tough. And I think like for the everyday guy in jiu-jitsu, if you really love jiu-jitsu, you should love enough where you do things that you don't like. What do I mean by that? If you don't like to lift, that probably shows that you should lift because <laughs> yeah. that's going to help you. That's going to help you do the things that you like. You know, like if you don't like doing diet or if you don't like having a healthy lifestyle, you probably should start, you know, having discipline to do that because that will help you stay on the mats longer. And I think it's just like about that, you know, uh, when it comes to performance, it doesn't change much. It just changes the levels of intensity, I think. 
Yeah, no, it's very true, mate. And do you do, uh, thinking about sort of recovery, obviously the, the weight training helps, as you say, do you do anything else? Like, I don't know, like um, cold plunges, yeah. massage, any yeah. all that sort of stuff? I do. I like I like cold plunges. Uh, if I ha- if I'm having like a, if I'm on a training camp, I need to do something related to water. Water. I need to be on the water. So cold plunges is a good option. In Austin, we do have a good good places where you can go outdoors and get cold water too, which is good. Sauna definitely helps my sleep. I think one thing that uh, jiu-jitsu athletes. I'm talking about athletes, not actually like the. Uh, uh, not actually the practitioners itself, but sometimes practitioners too is. We do need our sleep, but some people, they are not so focused on having the discipline to go to sleep at the right time as they are to wake up. What do I mean by that? Oh, I wake up at 5 a.m. every day, but do you have the discipline to go to bed at 9 p.m.? A lot of people don't because there's, nowadays so much things going on. And all of us, most of us train during the night. So whenever I have you know, stages where I'm sleeping at night, I just try to have a routine where it will help me go to bed early. I, I like to use red light therapy that kind of makes me almost like tired enough when I'm going to go to bed early. Sauna helps me, you know, fix my sleep schedule as well. And uh, as I said, cold plunge helps. Uh, lately, I started getting you know, to uh, some zone two work to help my recovery too, kind of like help my cardio. Uh, zone two work has been great to recover. So as I said, just like once I got this mentor on the strength side, John, uh, it opened up a lot of things on my mind about what are the things that I can do to help me uh, be better on the mats and help be a better athlete. I think in jiu-jitsu, people jump, you know, too fast into steroids without studying all the other aspects that can help you before that. If you do all those things and at the end you add a little bit of steroids, I think your, you know, your health will, ha- will, will, will like thank you a lot. So I think uh, I like to do it like this way because when it comes to longevity, I think it's very related to your habits. So that's why I'm always like trying to do that stuff. There's other things that I do. Like I said, a chiropractor, I like to do tissue work, but all those things help me be who I am at my best uh, on the mats. Yeah, definitely all helps, I think, doesn't it? Yeah, it's, 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 it's good that you actually realize that because the amount of people that we talk to and, and they all, everyone has um, different methods and different views on stuff like that, like flexibility work and different types of recovery and stuff. But it's great that you've got a coach that is just – you know, focusing on your body because effectively, if you can look after yourself over a period of time, you're going to compete at a better level and at a long for a longer period of time. Yeah, and I think the main thing for us is like our sport is so new, so there's not methods written mm. down. Like, if I'm a football player, I want to gain weight in the off season. Man, there's going to be many methods that you can find. You're going to do squats, deadlifts. You're going to eat as much calories. If I'm a jiu-jitsu guy and I have off-season, what should the off-season look like? Oh, we don't have off-season. Oh, man. So what's the closest thing I can have to off-season? Maybe two weeks off? What are you going to do with two weeks off? What are you going to focus on? So for me, it's just like discovering what uh, what are the things that I need in order for my body to be healthy. And as I said, it's not like I'm smart or anything. I need because my body, you know, oftentimes has, you know, almost like broke on me. So I needed to find ways to stay healthy and in and in and in and in thinking about longevity too. Yeah, hundred percent. And then just going back to uh, when you met Zanji and, and Saulo, um, back when you were a purple belt. I mean, for you at that time, that must have been like massive with with those pair kind of taking you under their wing and making the offer. How did that feel at the time? Do you remember? Man, it was great too because, uh, as I said, the place where I was from, Brazil, we do we did we, we we didn't have a lot of like stars going there, so I never had I never really had met them or kind of felt their style of jiu-jitsu. I knew people would say, but I was more you know in tune with the things that I would see on the daily basis. You know, we'd get Paul and Biawi and Leandro Lowe and those guys. So I I didn't know much about their style and never felt it. So. I went there after Rhodes as a purple belt, and I was able to roll as a purple belt with black belts and kind of held my ground, you know, like, I wouldn't do, like, bad, like, it would be, like, a round would be pretty even, like, of course, I would lose the round, but I would feel like, oh, man, I can kind of, like, stand up against this guy, but whenever I went there and did a session uh, with Shanji, Lovato, and Saulo, man, it was the worst thing ever, like, <laughs> they mounted me, they cross-choked me. They came over me from half guard. All the positions that made you look like a beginner, you know? And I'm like, man, what the hell is going on? Like, what just happened? So knowing that it could me be a, beat me up that bad made me think, like, there is such a big gap that I can actually be decent at this. So 
it was it, it was kind of like what made me think like I need this you know I need I need I need this push because if I'm able to one day you know survive against this guy and not have like a red belt imagine how much he's not going to get transcended to the actual competition mats because when I went to visit them I had just had my best performance ever up to that point which was double gold uh, at Worlds so when I went to visit them after that and I got beat up I was like there is so much more that I can learn and get better at so <laughs> it was kind of like an eye open experience and to not Days, uh, to this day, I make this joke that I'm so glad I went there after Worlds, not before, because if I had gone before Worlds, I probably would have won. Like, it would mess in my mind. <laughs> <laughs> How long did it take for you to close that gap? You know, um, you know, when you're getting smashed, when you finish that purple belt Worlds. How long did it take for you to kind of hold your own with the boys and uh, really feel like you belonged there? Still working on it, man. <laughs> <Just> <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were going to say that. <laughs> No, uh, I think uh, up to brown belt, we was uh, because for me it was almost like learning their style of jiu jitsu, you know. Mm. And a lot of times, as a, as a as a young adult, you were stubborn. So for me, for a good amount of time when I first joined them, I was kind of like stubborn. I was like, man, maybe I'm not just not doing the the right technique at the right time. So I just kept trying to go my ways, you know. But uh, as I got the second year, probably I got more experience and I actually got to do more nogi, feel a little bit of the rest. And I thought there was so much gaps. So I think. Towards like the end of my last year as a brown belt, maybe 2019, which was like probably one of my best years as color belt. I won everything as a brown belt, uh, double Grand Slam, Euros, Pans, Brazilian Nationals, and Worlds. <laughs> what year that is? That year, I felt like I made a huge improvement. So that's when I felt like, oh, I'm actually starting to learn their style. If you look at my matches in that year, I start using a lot of the stuff that they do, like. I kind of like pressure past a lot of people, made people tap for mount. I use a lot of the close guard. That's actually when I start being more effective with the close guard. Before I would do close guard, but more as an entry to my game because I used to do a lot of like matrix stuff as a pro belt and stuff like that. But at that year, I was I, I was I, I felt like really confident with the jiu-jitsu that they've been teaching me, and I was able to you know as I said like hang around more and like having more. M- give you more of a challenge for them in the training so i think that year was whenever like something clicked it was probably because it was a mix between me getting smashed too much and opening my mind to like man i actually need to learn this way it makes a lot of sense and also the result speaks itself i think throughout purple up until the last year as a brown belt i had not a lot of consistent results. Of course, I would win like ultra heavy most of the tournaments. But when it comes to absolute, sometimes I'll lose to guys that I felt like I knew I, 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 I had better technique than I had better jiu jitsu, but I would lose for you know a detail or maybe a strategy. So uh, that that, that kind of like helped me like get more mature. So I'll, if if there was a time that you asked like that something changed was probably like that year. Yeah, it's really cool, isn't it? Yeah, it's so cool. Yeah. <laughs> Which mentally, yeah, m- mentally, mentally, that year was really good for me too because I moved back to the to the gym. So I was living in the gym. So like living in the gym, like waking up early, going to bed kind of late, having to do a lot of the a lot of stuff, kind of helping like kind of like you know like I, I want to go out there and like you know tap people out. I want to earn my spot. So <laughs> it was a good it was a it was a good thing for my mind to complaining and stuff. Yeah, that's cool, man. And you obviously just talked us through what your sort of strength program looks like. I mean, as a, as a competitor and a coach, like, what, what do you think like the most optimal way to train jujitsu is in regard to sort of the, the sort of frequency and the intensity and the volume maybe across a week and then sort of break down a couple of sessions for us? Uh, I would say as a coach for my, for whenever, whenever I'm teaching jujitsu, if the person is just getting started, the main thing that I try to pass to them is like, don't focus on volume focus on being consistent, focus on making the, you know, making the time to be here at least twice a week. You know, if I can get you, if I can see you here twice a week for, you know, three years, I'll direct you to do that. Then you start twice a week, you start like in jiu So now you're coming five times a, a week and then you're doing an open mat. Later on, the guy's going to get hurt and then he's going to get back to jiu because the injury is always, you know, kind of like getting behind. So I'm big on just start slow, get your body kind of like get used to it, find the ways to help you be on a mat for a longer time is this, do you need to stretch more? Do you need more, you know, muscle mass? Do you need to work out? Do you need to sleep more? Are you hydrating? So I think like the, the, the very first year, almost like eight months, those guys need to kind of like find what helps them be on the mats for a longer time. And it kind of like helps them like change their schedule or adapt their schedule. They can be there 
at least twice a week. It's not something that is sporadic. I'm here full week and I'm gone for two weeks. So finding that consistency is the main thing. And whenever it comes through, you know, like you're already, you're already in, already training. The thing that I talk to my guys a lot is like building skill, you know, make sure that you're building skill. You're not just, you know, getting getting good at one thing and using that one thing out, pushing that one thing out to black belt. What do I mean? Oh, like I already know that I'm good uh, playing close guard and playing guard. I'm just going to, is stick to this to this all the way to black belt. I'm gonna become a master of this, and that's all I'm doing. I'm I'm not really I'm not really into that when it comes to my students. I want them to be kind of complete. Sometimes you know, like you're gonna be a guy that you're gonna hate the triangles, you're gonna hate the open guard. But I need you to you know, we do we do here by a week. I need you to that week open your mind and kind of learn and see what are the important points about playing the guard first because you know. You know how to defend it. You know how to play. You know how to defend it. You have an idea, a base in your mind, like, oh, this is what these guys look for. Second, if one day you want to be an instructor, you want to be confident enough where you can teach all sort of things, which is the thing that I feel confident on. I feel like I can, I can teach jiu-jitsu in, a, uh, in different styles of jiu-jitsu because of how open-minded I am as a practitioner. So I try to have them open-minded. I try to not let people, as they go higher on the belts, hide themselves behind the belt what do i mean that like use the belt as a shield what do i mean they just do where they're where, where they're comfortable with doing and they're going to push that on as they go up the belts like if you are a brown belt you should always be working on mountscapes you should always be working on pinscapes you shouldn't feel lost if someone has your, your back like a white belt has your back you should feel comfortable enough where you can find a way out sometimes they're going to type it but guess what that just shows that you have to get better at back escapes and for me that makes it the jiu-jitsu journey so much more interesting because now you need more information like oh man my back escape to the right side is not as good as the left side how can i get better at this so then you can kind of get into your body and like you guys you guys can brainstorm a way to get better at this and now you know like you're still doing jiu-jitsu but you're doing jiu where you're getting better at the skill you're not just killing yourself rounds after rounds so when it comes to practitioners, that's kind of the culture I try to build inside my school, a culture where you're always trying to get better at things. If you're too good at this thing, maybe start to put it aside for a second and seek for the next thing that you're going to kind of master or for the thing that is hurting you. Oh, man, I suck at triangle escape. Let's put some time on like escaping triangles. Let's let's find out why you get uh, triangles so often. Is it because your head is too low when you pass? Is it because you pass too low? You kind of like have to start passing a little bit higher, do a little bit of outside passing. So... That's the style that I like to teach. And for me, uh, defense is very important too when it comes to practitioner. Make sure that you can kind of like understand defending for uh, different positions. You can defend yourself. When I say defense, it's not like self-defense. like the jiu-jitsu defense part. Like when, some, when you get mounted, do you freak out or do you actually can, you know, just easily escape? You, can, you kind of have like a strong mount escape. You have a strong back escape. And part of that, I think, is Shanji. He's always working on the, 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 that with us uh, as far as like in a competitive side. So it opens my mind as a practitioner too and a teacher to always be kind of like work on those things. Yeah, that's great. And when you think about, uh, you talked about sort of, the, I guess, identifying the sort of weaker areas in your game. I mean, like, do you, what, what structure do you use for that? Do you like, write things down? Do you just use sort of practice to, to identify those gaps? And then if you select an area that you want to focus on, how long do you spend on that area typically? Having, that's when, that's when having a sensei or a coach inside the mats helps a lot because Shand is able to see where the gap is uh, and say, for example, like your half guard pass is not looking as good as your outside pass. Maybe you should stop and do a little bit more of that. And then it makes sense. Like I keep getting to half guard, but out of eight times, I'm able to finish a pass, maybe three. So he looks at it, he tweaks it. Now out of eight, I'm finishing passing like six out of eight. So you, I'm able to like to see that improvement. And when it comes to things more related to my style, the way I like to see it is I practice during class or it's class. It's not like competition training. It's like training my students what I like to do when I'm, you know, when I'm able to is go to a Shandis class and enroll the students. And then that's when I usually like to apply a different style. Maybe I'm just going to play close guard today. I'm going to see how my close guard is, and I'm going to go through the sequence over and over. If I'm having trouble applying a sequence with a regular guy, a student, that shows that there's something needed to get better. Why? Because if I can't do it to that guy, most likely I won't be able to do it to Philippe, which is like a high-level black belt. So that's usually how I try to think of my building a game. Leg lock, for example, is like a thing that I like to work a lot because in no gi, 
I think I have a really decent leg lock game, but with no gi, there is always something different that you're doing from the gi. So sometimes I get leg locks and I just want to work on leg locks. So I start in a position, I'm trying to see how many different entries I can do for that position or how many finishes I can do. For sure, I'm going to feel more comfortable doing more doing these more than the others. If I'm not as comfortable doing uh, some, that shows that I have to stir a little bit more. So what I might do is I might get someone that is an expert in it, which cross train helps me a lot. Sometimes I go to different schools and the guy does a slick entry. I mean, I'm like, man, I can't do the entry for shit. Like I tried to do the entry for years on my, my students. It doesn't work. What did you do different that I can do? The guy shows me this and I'm like, oh man, it works. When Kuzen, a good example is uh, on my last, who is number, who's number one match. I have been trying to do that a straight jacket, kind of like isolating the arm for a long time. Mm. But it never felt as smooth as it should. So I went and trained at the other gym in Austin and just basically like doing like some back training stuff. And the guy did it on me and it felt really smooth. So I was like, man, like, what did you do different on that? And he showed me a small detail and it was a purple belt. And then I went on and next super fight I did, I, I used the exact move. I was like, a purple belt just taught me the move that I used against like a black belt world champion. You know? so. <laughs> <laughs> it is always those little details though, isn't it? It's always those little little details, like loads of people, you know most positions and you know most things, but the difference between you and, a, and another black belt is is obviously your, your brain, but also like the, there's those little details, those little details yeah. that you're able to pick up and be able to rep over, over and over and over again. You know, that is literally yeah. the only difference, isn't it? And that having Shanj as a sensei is so great because a lot of those details, he's so good at it. Like, look at the guy. He, he does arm bars from close guard ADCC. So he got all this <laughs> from the arm bar. So whenever I can't do our arm bar very well in training, I can easily go to up to him like, Shanj, can you fix my arm bar? I literally come up to him and say, can you fix my arm bar? Because it's, it's fucking awful. So then he's like, all right, let's go to this. So I start doing this and he start he can see it because he's a master at it. So, I think that's the cool thing about jiu-jitsu. You're going to find people that are there throughout training. They're able to master different types of techniques. But I don't think you should be attached to only one style, only one only one technique. You can always open your mind and be good at different techniques. You know? So that's the beauty of it. And that's what I try to take as an athlete and as a student. Because if I'm able to learn you know, different techniques from guys that did a really good, if I can perform half as good as they did, I can beat a lot of people with that move. And if I can show a guy that is asking me, like a student, that move and he can use half as good as me, that's already good. And half as good as me, for now, if he keeps, you know, pursuing, seeking for getting better at it, he's going to probably get better at me at the technique, which nowadays I have students that they do moves that I'm like, man, this guy is doing this better than I do. It's like, and that's the beauty of it, you know, like to see it. And I think Shanji kind of sees it that way too. And that's why he never, uh, sees it from, he, he never shies away from showing me stuff, you know, like, and stuff like that. Yeah. It's, it's so refreshing hearing that such an accomplished competitor still learns from purple belts, man. It's so open-minded. It's great. It's great to hear. It's really cool. Yeah. You gotta be open to it. You know, I could stick to my ways and that would be, that would, uh, could I have finished some other way? Yes. But for me, adding a new technique and like be able to do it at a highest level is such like a, a good feeling, you know? Yeah, definitely. And then, and then when you actually, when you think about the actual sessions themselves, so there's obviously, there's a lot of debate these days around, you know, ecological training, drilling, you know, sort of, uh, do you do kind of like aerobic based warm ups? Do you do movement drills? Do you just go straight into drilling? I mean, what's your, what's your sort of preferred approach to, to a class or training structure? Uh, if I, if I, if I'm training comp competitor competition wise, like as an athlete, I always need the drills to kind of like learn the move. That's how I learn Jiu Jitsu. And, uh, that's how I like to warm up. Usually like before we start standing, I'm going to drill some wrestling and then I'm going to go through co my combinations. And eventually I'm going to start getting creative with as I get, as I get a uh, warm, you know, but drills for me are definitely important just to kind of like perform the move at first. Cause I was never, never very well coordinated. So I kind of need that movement, that drilling part to go over just to sharpen it before I do it live and performing live. I really like to kind of like, uh, how do I say, be really specific, which Sean is big on that shoe. Like with this specific training, like if I just drill this half guard pass, we're going to start a half guard. I'm going to try, be trying to perform it. I, usually it doesn't look as good right away because both of us, me and my partner just learned. So you kind of yeah. know how to counter. Uh -huh. So 
usually what I do is I either if I'm going to Gaita as a high level in comp class and this guy he kind of easily counter it, I'll just go to the guy that's the easiest to do it. And then, oh, this guy is easy to do it. So I'm going to do on him a couple of times, and then I'm going to go back to the guy that's giving me a big resistance. So if uh, if it's myself, I'll do that way. When I'm teaching nowadays, man, I'm really big on uh, I'm really big on really the panel skill level of the of the class on using those games to just like get them going. You know, like if someone is starting today, I don't really like to explain them a lot first because um, when I'm teaching, I try to be really professional with time. What do I mean? If you, ha- if you give me one hour to learn this on a day, I'm going to make sure that you take something out of that one hour, you know, and that something is not going to be me talking for 25 minutes and we're going to do calisthenics for 15 and then we're going to do 15 minutes of jiu-jitsu, you know, maybe like 10 minutes drilling and five minutes specific or drill or, or sparring or something. So with uh, even more with the beginners nowadays, I like to implement games a lot where on my mind, I try to make something for it to accomplish, and I try to make that something for it to accomplish not very hard. What do I mean? If I'm teaching outside passing, I'm going to restrict the guy that's playing guard from grips, so this guy that is doing outside passing can have an easier time doing the movement. And then, as he's kind of like, oh, he hit it three times, okay, now the guy on body can use one hand. Now he's hitting it with some sort of resistance. Towards the end, I'll give him full resistance, and I think uh, as, a, as a beginner, that helps the guy kind of understand like, oh, I am learning something. I'm not very good at it. But I think if I stick to this, I'll get better one day where I can actually, you know, perform it as much as I want with full resistance. So the mindset for me teaching is that nowadays, I want to teach in a way where the person is able to perform. Drilling, I still think is important for some of the moves because they can kind of see what it looks like and it kind of, kind of like, oh, it should look like this. I put my body this, but the quicker I can get to them to actually get moving and doing the thing with live resistance, the better. And that goes on for more than one sequence. If you can show them four sequences and go over five, four uh, specific trains for that sequence, that'll be great. And as I said, I'm really big on managing the resistance level within the sparring, like the specific round, because I don't want them to get frustrated on not get, don't get the move. And I don't want, um, the person about it to be a bad partner right off the bat. What do I mean a bad partner? You know, like everyone has, sometimes I'm myself, I'm a bad partner, just talking with my training party, you know, like I'm in class, like professor shows one move, we start specific training, I already know the counter, I hit him with the counter right away. But I'm just joking, <laughs> but so I'm just like, you know, messing with him. But some people, they'll take that pride, like, oh, I'm not going to let this guy do none of the moves throughout the whole specific training. You know, like I'm going to, I'm going to give him a hundred percent resistance. And for me, like, that's not helping you, and that's not helping your training partner. He's not building that skill. It will make him better. And by making him better, he'll make you better because it's going to give you a tougher challenge. So a lot of times people don't have that mindset yet. So I like to set up my class in a way where you're going to end up having a mindset and the person top will succeed by changing a little bit of the environment and, like, the, 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 the starting position, stuff like that. So, so it's like teaching that's how I like to do it as you go higher the level of the the class like the guys are more you know like a seminar or is it like a class where you have like purple belts and up i can be more talkative that, what what does that mean i can talk a little bit more i can be more detail um uh, i can be more specific with detail i'm like oh man yeah i do this grip here specifically because i know that he's gonna put his elbow right here and then when he puts his elbow right here, I'm going to move my hips a certain way. For me, teaching a white belt or someone that is dying like that is not the best use of your time because the funny thing is my fiance is like training jiu-jitsu with me. She didn't do jiu-jitsu before. And I would have the hardest time teaching her because I don't know if because it's me teaching her, she would not get the words that are <laughs> probably, coming out of her mouth. Probably. <laughs> I teach like a sequence like for 50 minutes. And at the end of it, she's like, can I listen to everything again? Like I didn't get anything. So I'm like, well, what's the more profit? What's the, it, it, for me, it was like, I don't think she's the only one. Sometimes she's probably the extreme example, but sometimes there, there are more people that are uh, having the same trouble. So what's the more proficient way that I can teach these people and make sure that they're having fun learning jujitsu till they're hooked enough where they're going to be like looking for ways to get more information out of jujitsu. So that's the approach that I used to teach nowadays. And honestly, it's a way that I might as well have a blast teaching the class. Everyone is breaking a sweat. Everyone's having fun. And it's been helping me, you know, being a, a good coach, uh, a better coach, as I see. 
Yeah, it's it's great. I think it's it's a, it's a funny debate between the two because, like you've just said, I think there's a a place for both. I think there's definitely a a place for sort of ecological training and, and task and game based training, but obviously for drilling and, and breaking down technique as well. Yeah, and I think yeah, and I'm always open minded and it always looks like oh, what's better, play guard or play top? Like I think it's the same thing. Like of course, if I'm a, a guy that I, I I'm heavy passer, I'm gonna say no. It's better to pass guard because this, this, and this. But myself, I'm a guy that I'm really open minded. And I'm I like to be dynamic, so that's how I like to take my teaching approach. You know, if I see something is not working as good, what are the things that I can look that are gonna make it better? And as I said, that that game uh, that game helps a lot. And the way that I actually saw it worked really well is for kids because. I started doing that for kids way before I started trying out with adults and the kids have a blast, you know, because for me, the worst thing walking up to a jiu-jitsu class or teaching a jiu-jitsu class is you teach jiu-jitsu and a lot of kids are just laying down because they had a long day of school. They had the commute to go there. They spent, I don't know, five hours of school. They woke up early. They went late to bed last night for some reason. So they are jiu-jitsu and they are like drilling. You, know, you teach them as an adult, but they're not mature as an adult where they're going to perform the drilling just as perfect. Of course, some kids are amazing. They will do it. But thinking about all the kids, some kids are going to struggle with that style of teaching. So whenever you start implementing the game, uh, for kids, it was so much better because now the kids are playing, but they're actually doing jiu-jitsu. So there is no like downtime. They're just going, 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 going. And, uh, and it's the same thing for adults. As they get older... I will definitely break it down where I can teach them more things because they're more in tune and they actually wanted to learn just because they like this sport enough where they'll care for what I'm saying, you know? Yeah, it definitely, it definitely works with kids. I've got, I've got a, a five-year-old and uh, he's been doing um, sort of some taekwondo just to learn a bit of discipline and, and sort of coordination, that type of thing. And people keep asking me if I teach him jiu-jitsu yet. And I'm like, well, I, I do, but he doesn't know it. And normally it's sort of teddy bear like attacking his sides, making him play a guard, or he's trying to get past my legs, yeah. and it's just game based. And like you say, they just have loads of fun, and they're kind of learning it, but they don't quite know it yet. So that's good. Yeah, and that's one of the things that uh, I started my martial journey uh, actually in judo, but I did, I did judo for a very little amount of time because the school uh, had judo closed, and eventually I became the jiu-jitsu school. But I was young, and one of the things I liked judo a lot there was so many games because. I think they've been doing it for way longer and there was so much games involved. And I, sometimes I would go there just to play the games. The judo part would be fine, but I would have so much fun. So bringing that style back, it kind of made him remember how much fun I had uh, playing those games, those tax games and like those uh, grappling games. That being said. Yeah, that's cool, man. Uh, Victor, have you got a little bit more time to tell us about your sort of competition prep, like what a camp might look like and then sort of day of the event and, and kind of like how you prepare for, for high level competition? Yeah, um, when it comes to preparation, you know, like I, if I'm not being, if I'm not preparing for a match, I like to take uh, my schedule. It's still as a professional athlete, but as I said, I like to work on building skills. So I'll show up to training. I'll be trying to improve in some areas, uh, and I'm really curious too. Like if someone starts doing something new in this sport, I'll definitely be looking into it. You know, like there's not that I'm not looking into it. And a lot of times, which is funny. I realized that lately on the sport, the pressure passing is getting like really popular. Maybe because of Gordon. Gordon's brought that back a lot. You know, everyone talks about Roger. But I have the. I'm lucky enough where if I have any doubts at all, on any question on that on that aspect of uh, Jiu Jitsu, I can ask Sean and he'll have a thousand answers. So <laughs> if there is ever something I'm curious that I want to develop my game on, I'll use that off season kind of like that I'm not prepping to work on it. Whenever I get a match that I sign up for a match, now is about doing the things that I know well and perform them on a daily basis, you know? And as I said, I'm a really kind of like a dynamic guy, so there's only one, one thing that I do. For example, walking up to the Nogi scene, I think a lot of people saw me as a leg locker. Victor has really good leg locks. But if you look at my uh, matches that I had uh, this year and last year as Nogi, I finished most of them from really dominant positions. I got a couple back take finishes, I was able to finish big them from mount. So it was like a change of a game. Not a change, but it's about being comfortable performing these things whenever the brights are on and not only on the training room. So I've been trying to adapt those things for a long time in the training room, but I finally was able to bring that style out to the competition. 
towards the end, I was doing a lot of wrestle laps, you know, before CGI and stuff like that. So there's a lot of things that I was working on the training room that I was able to bring it to my Nogi style. It kind of takes time for people to realize it because, you know, like you've been like locking people for three years and you start making people tap from mountain back for one. You're not going to, you're not going to change the perspective that quick. So I started changing perspective. I knew, I know, and I knew it was going to take time, but on a training room, that helped a lot. And what I want to get from this is if I'm in prep, now I have all those skills that I want to make sure that I give them a good amount of time doing the preparation, walking up to a match. So I feel sharp on all of them, you know, because I'm not the type of guy that I know what's going to happen on the match. But if I'm able to work on all those areas that I feel strong before the match, if you end up on one of these positions, I'm going to feel comfortable to, 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 to kind of finish the match. What do I mean? Like, everyone knows my strong game. Like, let's say close guard. Like, when I woke up with Nicky Rod, I knew we ended up in close guard a lot. But I wasn't sure which attack I was going to do. I wasn't sure if I was going to have a chance to wrestle up. And I knew for a fact that if I got on top, I had to work on keep him on, on bottom. Like, he's really good at escape from bottom. Not even, like, playing guard and stuff. Just, like, going back to standing. So... My preparation was all about make sure that I gave a good amount of work on those specific areas that I knew was bad unto him, but I had to make sure that they're sharp enough where if I needed them, they would be there. And also, I put big emphasis on defense. What if nothing goes well and like you end up in a really bad position? Like I was, I end up like hand off my side control once. And I was patient enough to just like frame and regard. If I didn't have to work that during my camp, I would probably, you know, done something different that would probably lead to a good position here. You probably like tap me out, but he got there on uh he got my side control and I spent so much time in my training camp there that whenever he got there I was kinda like comfortable. Of course it's still like a high level in a side control, but I was like I've been here before, like I had like, plenty of guys holding me in a body lock in this position, so I know what you do, just be confident and do it. So Hitting all those points during my preparation helped me being confident. And all the than that, the conditioning strength uh, uh, side of it uh, helped me just like the confidence of just going there and give it all. You know, like I put in the work, I did the strength work, I did my uh, assault rounds, I did my tabatas and stuff. So all things aligned it makes your confidence just like be like, you know, like at the highest level. So when I'm there, I'm really confident. I don't like to talk like as I'm going to win. Like I'm not that guy. I'm like, oh yeah, I'm going to submit him like this, this, that. But on my mind here, like everything is ready to go. And I'm locked in like, and I'm ready to go. So that's how I like to take my prep. And as I said, the, the more, like the, the more I can cheat, the better. What I cheat, like what are the cheat codes? My nutrition. This, for this camp, I want to bring my nutrition to like very clean my recovery for this camp, you know, like during the skill based time, I usually, I'm not like as locked in with my recovery as I am on camp. So if I'm going to have a six week camp, I need to have the discipline to do that sauna once a week, to jump on a cold plunge at least once a week to, you know, make sure that I go to bed early enough for a good, good amount of rest. Like, so I try to kind of like use those, you know, strategies to kind of give me uh, a better performance, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, it does, mate. It, it's yeah. I mean, they're almost to some extent the the easy wins, aren't they? Just the, the you know, providing you've got the right people around you to provide the the kind of direction and the information. You know, the jujitsu is really the the technical the the technical bit, the hard bit. So if you can dial in the rest of it, then it obviously gives you the best chance to demonstrate that that technical bit it makes perfect sense. Yeah, and I mean, it's so easy for me to go I, I, when I'm in camp, man. I hardly I hardly train uh, twice a day or more than twice a day, like as far as like jujitsu, I go in and I put in like three hours or like, you know, sometimes a little bit more than that. And I'm fine with it. Now it's about what I'm going to do the rest of the day that's going to support me for the next day. If I need to go that hard or, you know, what are the things that I'm going to do today to recover for the next hard session? Like I'm not the guy that's going to be spending eight hours on the mats first, because I have business to run. <laughs> and second, my body can, can't handle that anymore. You know, like I can't handle yeah. eight hours on the mat. Like by hour three, I'm going to be like walking like an old man. So. <laughs> yeah. I was going to ask what your competition rounds look like. If you do any, do you know, do, do you do, you do sort of uh, simulated competition rounds that sort of full intensity or do you not do that? It really depends uh, on, on, on what tournament I have coming up. Uh, for example, uh, if I give a clean example for something that I, it was really successful that I did for Worlds, uh, the Gi Worlds in 2023, uh, the matches are supposed to be 10 minutes. I think I did 10 minute rounds for probably one week. 
on the whole preparation. That was like probably did like five five days. Not not that I'm saying that I did five days in a row, but if you mm. count all the eight weeks mm. of preparation, that is one week there that I did probably like five five days of the of the eight weeks that I did ten minute rounds. All my preparation was around specific training and also short rounds, like what I'm trying to get out of the round as quick as possible because my goal was not to spend 10 minutes fighting. Like if I'm not, if my plan is not to spend 10 minutes going, cause I, I don't want to go for the 10 minutes. I want to submit. Why am I going to be doing so many 10 minute rounds? Like on my mind, if I do that many 10 minute rounds, walking up to that, the tournament, guess what? Once I'm there, I'm going to want to roll for the 10 minutes. Like my, my pace will be different. Mm, it's an interesting point. I rolled, I, I had, I got a lot of quick subs, you know, like, I submitted the, the last finals, Eric, I think was like a minute and a half because my, my my brain was, it was like sharp on those like short rounds, get where you want fast. And once you get there, be really precise on finishing it. So we worked a lot of that, like not, not saying that I worked like the specific technique, but the mindset was there, like of getting to these positions early, not leaving a lot of space to mistakes. So on my preparation, there's a lot of specific rounds, you know, I don't do a whole lot of like open rounds just as I do uh, specific rounds first because uh, when I do a lot of like just sparring, my, my training room is not as big. Like if you look at our training room, like the pictures we post, like we have six guys, we have five guys. So if you're rolling with each other for 10 minutes every day, we're going to like start fighting or <laughs> we don't want to see each other anymore. <laughs> so we, <laughs> we did it. And also like body's going to break. Like it's not like yeah. you're getting a break. Like you get six guys, we're all big, we are skilled. So, our bars can only sustain so much. So we try to be really smart with how, um, let's say I'm training Danny. Like I'm not going to use Danny for the same amount, for the same type of round every day. Like we're going to train different weights. Like one day we're going to just work on a back escape on back attacks. The other day we're just going to work in attacks on guard. So it's almost like I'm using him as more than one training part because I'm using him in different areas of Jiu Jitsu because my back, my back attack is not going to be, you know, it's not going to feel the same as my straight ankle attacks. So I'm giving you different levels of, uh, of resistance throughout the week. So we, we, we work in different areas, the same training partner, and we don't feel like you're tired of each other. Like it's still fun. You know, and some days you do more standing, some days you do more pin scapes. So that's part of like how Shanji likes to train too. And it just became the, the way that I like to train as well. Like, and he's usually the guy leading the competition training. So that's how it goes when it comes training with us. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And then when I was asking, I, I thought you might say something to that effect, just more so because of the, I guess, the injury prevention and just looking after your body. But it was a really interesting point you made about the uh, the pacing. I'd never really thought about that, but that makes perfect sense that you'd, you'd yeah, you wouldn't want to have that sort of slower pace for a longer match if that's not what your outcome yeah. or your intention is. And with my experience, when I get onto the mat, onto, onto a match against somebody, I can kind of feel or tell how their training is, but how they fight or how they fought. What do I mean by that? I can tell that this guy is in a school where they do a lot of like hard rounds because he's really tough, but he's not as like sharp technically. I'm not saying he's bad at jiu-jitsu, but it's just his style. I can tell. He's a strong, has a good sequence, has good passing, but I can tell that, you know, like he doesn't go as deep when it's come to technical, you know, things like – for example, like he just fought that guy, the guy turtle four times and he couldn't tap the guy on the fourth chance that he had when he got turtle. The guy regarded and he passed the guard again. Like you can see the gaps, you know, like so sometimes watching or fighting somebody can feel like how the train is like, you know, like because of like the gaps and the strengths that they have within their competition game. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine. And then your actual comp day, what does your like your warm up and your sort of pre stepping on the map? sort of preparation that like uh depending on the time of the day big meal or small meal you know if it's if if i'm competing closer to the time that i wake up it's gonna be a small meal in the morning a bigger meal uh a night after and if i'm competing later on the day i just try to you know distract myself as much as i can prior to like three hours or four hours before the tournament what do i mean like if i compete late in the night i'm not going to be thinking about my match all day because it's going to drain you so i just like to kind of like do things unrelated to that maybe go for a walk maybe watch a movie hang out at the hotel i will one thing that i do even more for the super fights even more is like i work out before my my super fights that's been helping me a lot like i go um 
UFC Fight Pass usually is in Vegas. So what I do is usually UFC Fight Pass is really late. Like probably we have to get there like eight or seven. So I wake up in the morning, I eat a big breakfast. I go back to my room, I relax. And then around like 12, I'll go do a hit a workout. I'm not going to max out. I'm going to hit a PR. I'm just going to get a nice pump and like activate everything. So I get the workout in, I go back to my hotel room. I relax now, but now I relax in a state of ready. You know, like I have the redness. I'm not like feeling lethargic throughout the whole day. So for super five sets, I think that I kind of learned how to, to do it. And it, it helped me out well. Why? Open, open, open tournaments or like championships, you're definitely going to have more to run around. So hardly I'll do like a workout. Sometimes when I do, it's more like a PT type of workout, like just more going through the exercise that I do on my daily basis to warm my body up. But I warm up with a round and then I go into the, to the, to the fight. With super fights, I have this almost like, I, I try to, I try to take it as like a regular day. Like, I have a breakfast, I go to my workout routine, definitely weighs less weight and stuff like that. Uh, but I do hit a good amount of like big muscles. And then as I go back to the hotel room, I chill out a little bit, throw one more meal in. And then once I head to the venue, I make sure that even, you know, before one hour before the match, I get like a, a sparring and like, I want to go to the match sweating. I do a sparring round, I do a couple of drill rounds, and then I walk into my match feeling ready to go. It felt almost like I went through one or two matches before and like my body and my mind is ready to go you know so so my to my super fight is more like that to my championship tournaments it's more like a marathon type of deal like i start the day slow before my first match i will warm up but i'm not going to exhaust myself because i don't know how long to i get my second match so i just want to get into the match making sure that i'm not lethargic that means i'll do a couple of pt exercises I'll probably do one round, like light, like sparring, like almost like a a, a, a flow row, and then I'll go into my uh, first match, like ready to go, but not super like high. Yeah. You know, like the reason why is because I have done that, and that kind of like takes a tool on my body early in the day, and then I have to be fighting till later in the day, and I'm gonna make myself tired. So it's kind of weird how it plays out, but it's just like doing tournaments helps you kind of like find your own pace, you know. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a tough one to manage, but I think, like you said there, the, the experience is going to be key, isn't it? And what works for you. And you mentioned earlier as well about uh, sort of doing a bit of research around your opponents, helps you visualize. It, do you kind of put much stock into like psychology and, and visualization and, and that type of thing? Like, have you got any advice around mindset for people if they're nervous before a comp? Yeah, whenever I was at Purple Belt, I was kind of like struggling with a few things on competition, you know, like I will get to competition and I wasn't performing as I wanted because uh, I think I wasn't like mentally prepared. Like I would feel a little bit lethargic. I'd feel like I didn't want to be there. I feel like I was like watching myself compete instead of compete. So I did a couple, uh, I did a couple mentorships to some guys that are like, you know, uh, specialists on sports mentality. And I got a couple tips that helped me up to today, you know, like, man, when you walk to the tournament, like, I usually want that a guy said it to me is like, a little bit before you walk into a match, like, just look around and like, see all the people that are there to watch you or even watch the, like, you can make it up as they are there to watch you, which is fine. And you like watch there, you look at their uh, friends that are there, and then that's gonna help you kind of like be on the moment. Like, hey, you were here, it's now. And the way why I start looking like doing that because whenever I was doing this work with this guy, we went over a sequence, and it was way more deeper than that. Now there, I take it, I take it, I take it more, more lightly, but it was way more deeper than I was a burrow belt, and it was before Rose, I think, and he was he made me like visualize each match how how it was gonna go. For me, it was kind of crazy. I was like, man, I'm going to do this, but I'm not sure if it's going to go that way. But honestly, it went like 70% of the way that we plan things. You know, like, not like the exact finishes and stuff like that, but the pace, how the day went, how I was able to finish the matches, how confident I felt, it really helped. So I was like, man, that is something to visualizations. That's when I first started, like, respecting and kind of, like, admiring that part of, like, the, the psychology for sports. So, fast forward, like, you know, like, I worked with that guy for a little bit. I it's just like jiu-jitsu. I kept the little bit that I learned from him, and I just kept using on uh, my, my my routines and my tournaments from early on. So there's a couple things that I like to do, you know, and when I say visualize, just like visualize the day. I like to also look back and remember, you know, the effort that I put through, through the training camp. You know, uh, there's this book I read, like the cookies in the jar, how many cooks I left in the jar. 
uh, as far as like hard work, the days I didn't want to train, I went and trained. The days where training was harder, when I think or what I thought I couldn't do it, and I did it, I was able to, you know, uh, uh, be relentless and, and finish. So all those things I like to, you know, leave it in the jar. And if I ever feel in a comp- competition and it hits me with that like imposter syndrome, oh, should I be here? Am I ready to be here? Like I can go look, look back, pull a cookie out of the jar. Like oh yeah, like there was this day where I killed myself training, and it wasn't that long ago, but. At least for me, you know, for some people, it's so easy for you to forget how much work you put in up to a big competition because you start getting anxious about the competition. You forget about the whole training camp you did, you know. But yeah, that's usually how it goes as far as like mentality and stuff like that. Yeah, and I guess to some to some extent, then that ties in a little bit to, I guess, not to, well, maybe a tactic, but also just have being clear in your head what you want to achieve in, in each match as well, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. And as you compete more you're gonna know what guy what the guy can offer and what you can offer so the way i like to think is like i like to think my style going um dominating his style so what are the ways that like my style can beat his and like thinking about that thinking about that and then see what happens you know yeah mate yeah, that's awesome victor we've we've kept you for a while mate so uh so thank you so much for your time i mean there's tons of information there <laughs> it's been really cool just chatting to you and learning about that sort of championship mindset um, and you know how you've achieved all the amazing things that you've achieved. Uh, we've still got a couple of minutes though. So if there was anything that you wanted to talk about, um, if you wanted to tell our audience about anything you got going on, projects, business stuff, if you want to shout out anybody, then feel free. Uh, I think more now, like what I what I look forward to do more is like for the past four years, I spent a lot of time in the U.S. You know, building things that have been uh, built lately. I built a great life here. I have a business. You know. Uh, but now, now what I want to do is like expand kind of like my network, meet more people. I know you guys are based in the UK. I haven't, I, I haven't set foot in UK to train. I was there, uh, for Lovato's, uh, title match back, I think in 2020. And that was, that was the only time I was there. Like I didn't even train. We were just like busy with the, with uh, helping in and stuff for the championship. So I want to get back to travel the world and kind of share a little bit of my journey, share a little bit of my style, you know, like I think. The best way I can do that is through competing, you know, because everyone's going to be watching, like flow grappling, UFC Fight Pass. Those guys give you uh, the chance to show your your talent in front of a lot of people. But I look forward to just making more connections, traveling a little bit more, you know, get to know more people. I am really happy on how the Big Man Flow has been expanding. A lot of people from outside of the country, people from everywhere, the same Big Man Flow and stuff like that. They're getting to know more of my style, getting to know why i use that name you know there's there's like a catch thing about this it's not like i'm just saying it you can tell that like as a big guy i roll differently so i want to look more like to expand that and uh the way that i see is just like that the internet is cool and stuff but i really like that one-on-one um that one-on-one interaction that means like if we go to a seminar if i have a conversation if i go train so yeah that's one of my goals for next year maybe get a little more traveling done so i can expand a little more my brand and other than that just keep working i think as far as competition i'm in a position right now that i'm kind of like i'm not sure what's next definitely i still want to get on the no gay run why is that is because uh i'm facing difficult challenges that kind of motivates me to get back to it and like oh let's like right now i'm making a joke with my friends like they're gonna be the big man flow 3.0 version 2.0 2.0 version was like last year. 3.0 version is going to be the next version. So what can I bring on this next version of myself? You know, like, and the goal is just to go up on the Nogi ranks. Now with the competition scene being kind of split, it makes it hard for you to, as an athlete to like, oh, I want to win this term. Because if I say I want to win this term, but another term it comes up and you got to change, like, you know, like you don't know. So there's definitely names. Like I want to compete against the guys that are above me on the, on the ranks. And when I say ranks, it can be flow grappling ranks. Or any other ranks, there are some guys there that I haven't competed that I want to compete against, or that I have competed and uh, I haven't had the chance to get a rematch. So right now, I want to stay healthy, get back to you know full, 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 full hundred percent, and then start you know going after those names. Man, I think uh, it's going to be exciting. It's something that drives me, you know, like having that name, like having big challenge makes me like, oh, what are the things that I can do in this camp to you know get better and you know give the good fight and put out a good show so that's the thing that's been driving me up the most i'm not sure if what championships are going to fight or what tournaments or super fights but right now it's just about getting 100 percent. and as i feel ready to come back you guys are going to be seeing face somebody with a big name and that's what we do you know yeah it'd be great i look forward to it mate is there anybody in particular that you'd really like to compete against at the moment 
Well, prior to uh, ADCC, the big match uh, that was being talked about was me and Marigali, but we both ended up not having our best weekends. So that kind of <laughs> like scrambled, scrambled the super fight road a little bit, I guess. So I don't know, like it's very hard to say. One guy that called me out uh, up to that point was Tena. He called me out back on one of the, after beating Lovato, I, guess, I think. I can't remember the month, but it was before ADCC. He had the best weekend at ADCC. He looked the best time he's looked in a while. So it would be cool to run that one because we never fought each other. Other guy that had an amazing weekend was Kynan. Last time we fought was in the Gi. Uh, it was definitely cool to do a no-gi one at some point. And, you know, like whenever Mary got his health healthy, and I'm, I'm, as I said, I'm dealing with some injuries right now, nothing serious, but some of that I, I, it's taking me some time to recover. I think that'll be, you know, in the books too. Like people will be talking about it too. So I think there are names out there. I think the main thing now is just me being healthy enough where I can, you know, give a good fight and perform as I want to perform. Yeah, there'd be some great matches, man. I look forward to those if they happen. And I think if you get the opportunity to come to the UK, that would be amazing. I mean, we'd certainly have you for a seminar. We'd love to to, to work with you and, and learn from you. Yeah, and- man. I think the whole UK would be keen to, to to jump on seminars. And obviously, you know, we've got Polaris and, you know, a couple of events here that I'm sure we'd love to have you as well, mate. Sure, sure. That's another thing I say, like, not only like go and like teach, but also it'd be cool to compete a little bit more abroad, you know. Of course, competing in the U.S., financially speaking, and, uh, you know, as far as like for your brand, is good because, you know, everything's here. All those big tournaments mm-hmm. are being uh, held here, but... I do love to travel and compete abroad, you know, like as a color belt, that's one of the most fun things I did. I went to compete Europeans. I competed in like some sketchy tournaments in Eastern Europe. I competed in Asia. <laughs> <laughs> but it was just so fun, you know, like, and I, I like to compete outside of here. It's just the energy is cool. And that's one of the yeah. things I want to do to compete on those other promotions. And I just got to be healthy and like ready to go. So that's the, my, my, my main focus right now. And thank you guys. Thank you guys for the opportunity. Uh, it was good talking to you. I uh, hope everyone listening has a good time. And yeah, follow me on Victor Hugo JJ to see what's up, what I'm going to be up next. And I think that's it, right, guys? Awesome. Brilliant, mate. Thank you. Thanks for coming on, my man. Thank you. All right. Thank you, guys.